We're beginning Chapter 11, Henry Kissinger's New World Order of Emerging Viruses, AIDS, and Ebola, Nature, Accident, or Intentional. Not long after our return to Boston, I needed to fly out to the West Coast again to give a presentation in Bellingham, Washington. The following day, while killing time at the Village Bookstore, a discounted hardcover caught my eye, Kissinger by Walter Isaacson. At the time, Jackie was spiritually engaged in the Celestine prophecy following our San Francisco trip. She had relinquished her investigative chores for a good reason. We were pregnant. On entering her first trimester, a naturally protective maternal instinct arose. Where we had so far discovered in our search of the origin of AIDS was so disturbing that the stress, we feared, might have an adverse effect on our developing child. Our concern was magnified by the fact that Jackie had miscarried twice during the past year. The intensity of our deadly innocence investigation that exposed the Florida dental AIDS cover-up, sifting through sacks of sickening testimony, obtaining and analyzing FBI reports on dozens of serial killers, and the constant reminders from caring friends and loving family that we were placing our lives at risk would have scared off any soul searching for the comforts of a nurturing womb. It was obvious she'd be better off focusing her attention on more soothing subjects, so I purchased Kissinger. I knew I would be pursuing it alone. From this point on, though Jackie maintained an interest in the investigation and frequently asked about my ongoing discoveries, what had been largely our cooperative labor was now my sole passion. Trauma and Escape from Nazi Germany. I found Isaacson's book fascinating. The meticulously referenced text quickly taught me that Heinz Alfred Kissinger had been a key player in U.S. foreign policy from the late 1950s to the time of this writing, and today too. Naturally, the author began by reviewing Kissinger's early history. Henry Kissinger was the first-born son of German-Jewish parents, Louis and Paula. The couple led their family to freedom in August 1938, less than three months before the Kristallnacht riots destroyed most of the Jewish institutions in Nazi Germany. Convenient, mm -hmm. My life in Fürk seems to have passed without leaving any lasting impressions. Kissinger told a German reporter recently that part of my childhood is not a key to anything. Minimizing the trauma he faced as a 15-year-old refugee, statements added, I was not consciously unhappy. I was not acutely aware of what was going on. For children, these things are not that serious. Give me a break. I thought on reading this. He's either got to be kidding or steeped in massive denial. I was, I too was a firstborn son of a German Jewish father, an Austrian mother who were also fortunate to have survived the Holocaust. I could relate to Kissinger's plight better than most, given this background, plus my postdoctoral degree in behavioral science. I understood well the role persecution can play on the development of personalities and personality disorders. My mother, at age 16, was among the last group of Jews to leave Nazi Austria. Her immortal picture can be seen in the National Holocaust Museum, where she, among dozens, was photographed on her knees scrubbing the streets of Vienna at Nazi gunpoint. She, along with her brother, who was 13 at the time, and the other refugees in our family never forgot those nightmarish days. Understandably, they lived a largely paranoid life. My mother and I argued for decades about what I judged, perhaps in retrospect incorrectly, to be her unjustified paranoia that Nazis could once again assume power and control over world events. She was right. 
Though Kissinger may have been spared the worst, I found it incomprehensible that he could have left Nazi Germany at that age and time unfazed. Excuse me. Yeah, there we go. Denial and paranoia. I was not alone in this view. Kissinger's childhood friends also felt his denial was a form of self-delusion, Isaacson wrote. Some of them see his escape from memory as a key to his legendary insecurities. The child who had to pretend to be someone else so that he could get into soccer games, they say, became an adult who was prone to deceit and self-deception in the pursuit of acceptance by political and social patrons. Whereas Kissinger's childhood friends recalled numerous traumas, young Heinz allegedly felt nothing. We couldn't go to the swimming pool, the dances, or, tea or the tea room, Werner Gunderfinger said. We couldn't go anywhere without seeing the sign Juden Verboden. These are things that remain in your subconscious, Frank Harris argued. We all grew up with a certain amount of inferiority, Otto Pretzfelder added, You can't grow up like we did and be untouched. Every day there were slurs on the street, anti-Semitic remarks, calling you filthy names. The Hitler Youth, which included almost all the children in Furch, sang in ranks in the streets and paraded in uniform, and Henry and his brother would watch them, unable to understand why they didn't have the right to do what others did, recalled Linda Rao Schubach. Anti-Semitism was a feature of Bavaria and did not start with Hitler. Menachem Lyon added, We didn't have much, if any, contact with non-Jewish children. We were afraid when we saw any non-Jewish kids coming down the street. We would experience things that people couldn't imagine today. But we took it for granted. It was like the air we breathed. Despite Kissinger's denials and Nazi atrocities, were able to damage his soul, said Fritz Kramer, a German Gentile who resisted Hitler and later became Kissinger's student in the U.S. Army for the formative years of his youth. He faced the horror of his world coming apart, of the father he loved being turned into a helpless mouse. Kissinger's most obvious personality traits, Kramer argued, could be traced to his Nazi experience. It made him seek order, and it led him to hunger for acceptance, even if it meant trying to please those he considered his intellectual inferiors. His drive for social acceptance and his paranoid tendencies were both reasonable reactions to a childhood violated by one of the most gruesome chapters in human history. As a result, during his career, he was often known to compromise his beliefs to impress those he feared. For Kissinger, the Nazi experience served the connection between God's will and historic evolution, a basic principle of the Jewish faith and one of its most important contributions to Western philosophy. For faithful Jews, historic meaning is linked to divine justice. After witnessing Hitler's horror, Kissinger abandoned his religion and embarked on an intellectual journey to find an alternative way to interpret history. Kissinger's traumatic childhood also instilled in him a deep distrust of other people. He felt compelled to establish secret wiretaps on the phones of even his closest aides. Another symptom of Kissinger's Holocaust rearing was his tendency to disguise, as an adult, any sign of personal weakness. This consistent compulsion of his had been commonly observed particularly in his approach to foreign policy negotiations. Kissinger's father, whom he loved deeply, was graced by gentleness and a heart of unquestioning kindness, but such virtues served only to make him seem weak in the face of Nazi humiliations. Thus, as Kissinger matured, he repeatedly attached himself to forceful 
often overbearing patrons with powerful personalities, including Nelson Rockefeller and Richard Nixon. Still, another childhood legacy was his philosophical pessimism. He maintained a dark and verboten worldview, suffused with a sense of tragedy. He embraced the view that civilization's tendency is toward decay, and statesmen must continually fight against the natural tendency toward international instability. The Nazi experience could have instilled in Kissinger either of two approaches to foreign policy, an idealistic, moralistic approach dedicated to protecting human rights, or a realist, real politique approach that sought to preserve order through balances of power and a willingness to use force as a tool of diplomacy. Kissinger would follow the, the latter route. Given a choice of order or justice, he often said, paraphrasing Goethe, he would choose order. He had seen too clearly the consequences of disorder. As a result, Nixon's Secretary of State became a philosophical, intellectual, and political conservative. He developed an intuitive aversion to change through revolution and became uncomfortable with the passions of democracy and populism. In essence, Kissinger never embraced the messy glory of the American political system, particularly since it constrained his real politique approach to administering foreign policy. Throughout his career, Kissinger confronted a recurring tension that in his view existed between realism and morality. Survival, he argued, at times required that moral standards be disregarded. This, he noted, was inconceivable to the people who had lived sheltered lives. He contrasted the callous realist who survived with the men of high morals, who, during rough times, had no chance. In his later years, Kissinger equated moral sensitivity to personal weakness. Chief Intelligence Officer and Nazi Hunter When the 84th Infantry Division received its order to embark for Europe in September 1944, Private Kissinger was with the 335th Infantry Regiment six years after his escape from Hitler. He and his G Company invaded Germany, th though he never fired a shot. Thanks to Fritz Gustav and Ton Kramer, a proud aristocrat German expatriate who took a shining to the overflattering private, Kissinger was soon assigned to a safer position in General Bowling's Army Intelligence Unit. Kramer got him assigned to translate for the general, and instigated his selection as a chief administrator overseeing the occupation of a captured town, or of overseeing the occupation of captured towns. In essence, Kramer paved Kissinger's way into the counterintelligence corps. From there, he was selected to teach military intelligence in Germany. During his German stint in army intelligence, Kissinger refrained from expressing, expressing any animosity toward the Germans. In fact, his bio, biographer noted, he reserved his anger for those counterintelligence agents, particularly Jews, who gave vent to anti-German feelings. I remember one occasion when some of these refugee interpreters were being a little abusive to a civilian couple. One army colleague, Ralph Ferris, recalled, Henry began yelling at the questioners thusly, you lived under the Nazis. You know how abusive they were. You know how... Oh scratch that last remark, how can you turn around and abuse these people the same way? Kissinger went even further. He kept quiet, in so far as it was possible about the fact that he was Jewish. He no longer practiced his religion and never brought it up. And though his army colleagues, of course, knew him as a Kissinger, he called himself Mr. Henry among the Germans in his jurisdiction because it sounded more American than Jewish. I used the name Mr. Henry, he later explained, because I didn't want the Germans to think that 
the Jews were coming back to take revenge. Right. As a chief army counterintelligence administrator with jurisdiction over more than 22 towns, Kissinger honed his diplomatic skills. Frequent dinner guests included the mayor of Bensheim, the pre-Hitler police chief who helped Kissinger identify and arrest local Nazi leaders and others who might serve American intelligence interests. Henry was an excellent diplomat, said Bechhofer. He was able to get along with German officials and make them do his bidding. In short order, the towns were looking... In, in short order, the towns were working and the region had been denazified. What is this? Figure 11.1. Declassified document explaining the CIA's Project Paperclip and Project 63 programs to locate, recruit, and exfiltrate Nazi scientists to serve American intelligence interests. Project Overcast, later renamed Project Paperclip, was the top secret program set up in 1945 by the War Department to relocate, recruit, and exfiltrate to the United States hundreds of Nazi scientists, specialists in rocketry, biological warfare, aviation, av av aviation medicine, wind tunnels, and the like. This declassified document is dated June 2, 1953, and signed by Air Force Chief of Staff and former Director of Central Intelligence, Hoyt S. Vanderberg. Vandenberg. It indicates that at least 820 Nazis... 820? Oh, you know, this Project Paperclip was actually going on long before Project Paperclip was ever in instilled. Central Intelligence Hoyt S. Vander Van and Vandenberg, it indicates that at least 820 Nazis were brought to the U.S. under paperclip seen as a meaning of obtaining the services of foreign specialists for the U.S. military. Reliable accounts indicate they numbered in excess of 900. Other parallel programs was Project... Other parallel... Another parallel program was Project 63 to bring certain preeminent German and Austrian specialists to the U.S. with the primary intent of denying their services to political enemies. Vandenberg acknowledged, however, that their utilization was a desirable feature. Many of these hundred Nazis, including SS and SA officers, were provably guilty of war crimes and prosecutable before the Nuremberg Tribunal. To get them out of Germany into the United States, the Joint Intelligence Objective Agency, responsible to the Joint Chiefs of Staff for administration, the Joint Chiefs of Staff for the administration of paperclip, shamelessly set about altering, hiding, and destroying the evidence of their recruits' atrocities. Security reports researched and written by U.S. military intelligence were located and changed. When some State Department officials discovered the changes, further changes were made and lies were told. An extremely valuable account of the exfiltration program by freelance journalist Linda Hunt, who spent 18 months using the Freedom of Information Act to obtain the relevant files, appears in the April 1985 Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. How also the Germans got into America, largely unknown by Hoover and a lot of the main people who had really high intelligence clearances, was that they used the Department of Energy's clearance, the highest clearance apparently in our country, that, or a Q clearance under the Department of Energy. So anybody in the Department of Justice or the Department of Defense didn't really have clearance to see what was being hidden under the Q clearance status without being part of the Department of Energy. Isn't that neat? Also, allegedly, the Department of Energy's got a smuggling ring going around because who's going to check the radioactive fuselage for anything, huh? Great, right? Brilliant bastards. Shortly thereafter, Kramer played patron to Kissinger again and promoted him to teach Allied military officers how to uncover Nazis and restore German civil authority 
at the European Command Intelligence School in Oberon Magau. The Nazis uncovered by Kissinger and his students were, ev were evaluated for their potential to serve as American military and industrial assets. In particular, Allied Intelligence was looking for Nazi scientists who maintained special expertise in rocketry, biological warfare, and other areas of military medicine. More than 900 Nazi scientists were eventually recruited under this Department of Defense secret Project 63. Figure 11.1, .1, published by Covert Action Publications Incorporated, a Washington, D.C.-based nonprofit CIA watchdog organization, described this project in more detail. The Harvard expertise. In the fall of 1947, Kissinger returned from Germany to join Harvard's class of 1950 as a 24-year-old mentally gifted sophomore. Sophomore, Harvard at the time was bristling with excitement. George, Mick George Bundy, then a government professor, recalled international affairs was expanding as a discipline, and Harvard believed it had a new role because the country had a new role. During his 1947 commencement speech in Harvard Yard, Secretary of State George Marshall inaugurated his post-war European re revival plan that semester, a forum featuring Joseph Aslop and I.F. Stone debated the issue. We must, must we stop Russia? The Carnegie Foundation heralded its funding of the university's area studies program in which the first task was to establish a Russi Russian research center to support America's emergence from isolation. At Harvard, Though discrimination evaded extinction in some departments, it was at least it was least noticed in the government department wherein Kissinger majored. We never ever discussed our Jewishness, recalled Arthur Gilman, Kissinger's roommate, but during late night discussions, Kissinger strongly opposed Israel's creation. He said it would alienate the Arabs and jeopardize U.S. interests, which it has. I thought it was a strange view for someone who had been a refugee from Nazi Germany. Herbert Engelhart, another dormitory resident, said, I got the impression that Kissinger suffered less anti-Semitism in his youth than I did as a kid in New Jersey. Kissinger's university acquaintances described him as an intensely driven, excessively mature, incessant reader who bit his fingernails and established his own rules. Despite his expressed interest in sports, the young immigrant skipped all athletic events, avoided drinking and partying with his housemates, failed to join clubs or societies, contributed nothing to school publications, and made no effort to participate participate in student activities. Henry would be charming if he decided he wanted to be, said Gilman, but he was really a loner. Engelhardt, while claiming a grudging affection, confessed he was deadly serious all the time. He never liked to chase after women. His famous wit and nuisance were not in evidence when he was an undergraduate. He had no judgment, no feel for what was happening around him, no empathy for people he was with. He was clumsy, socially awkward, I guess a little shy. Basically, he was a very limited person. With his interests piqued in government and philosophy, a straight A student became fascinated with William Yandel Elliott his first semester course professor in the development of constitutional government. Owing to outstanding ac academic achievements, Kissinger was entitled to have Elliot serve as his senior faculty tutor, and in recommending Henry for Phi Beta Kappa, Phi Beta Kappa, Elliot's endorsement read, I would say that I have not had any students in the past five years, even among the summa cum laude group, who have 
had the depth and philosophical insight shown by Mr. Kissinger. On the other hand, his mind lacks grace and is Teutonic in its systematic thoroughness. He has a certain emotional bent, perhaps from a refugee origin, that occasionally comes out, but I would regard him as, on the whole, a very balanced and just mind. Though Kissinger became attached to Elliot, he diplomatically paid homage to Professor Carl Frederick, who, with Elliot, represented the twin pillars of the government department. In fact, the aspiring diplomat became famous for his ability to transcend the political rivalry Elliot and Frederick demonstrated. Kissinger's Meaning of History In Harvard's 350-year history, wrote Isaacson, it had learned to take in stride the peculiar combination of intellectual brilliance and quick quirkiness that occasionally blossoms among its undergraduates. Even so, Henry Kissinger's senior thesis is still described in odd tones. A 383-page meaning of history introduced themes about freedom, morality, revolution, creativity, and bureaucracy that recurred throughout Kissinger's life. It provided a taste of the intellectual haughtiness for which he became famous. It provided an impression of how the future statesman waged the pursuit of peace as a constant balancing act that lacked larger meaning. In his chapter covering the early 20th century political philosopher Spangler titled History as Intuition, Kissinger paraphrased the nationalistic German scholar, amidst a repetition of cataclysmic wars, the civilization petrifies and dies. Thus Kissinger advanced Spangler's portrayal of history as an incessant and existentially doomed power struggle, uh, a vast succession of catastrophic upheavals of which power is not only the manifestation but the exclusive aim. It would be wrong, Isaacson cautioned, to identify Spangler's gloomy views with those of Kissinger's, who sought to find a more palatable meaning in history, but it would be inaccurate to ignore the perverse fascination that the brooding German refugee had for Spangler. Kissinger's historic pessimism, inbred as a boy, set him apart from the traditional American mavens of manifest destiny. The Kiss then Kissinger provided a stark portrayal of human determin historic determinism. Life is suffering. Birth involves death. Transitoriness is the fate of ex existence. Transitoriness is the fate of existence. The cure for this more bun state of affairs, according to his thesis, lies in the development of personal awareness and inward conviction of each individual's freedom, a philosophy advanced most notably by the famous French existentialist Jean Paul Sartre, who, following the lead of Karl Marx, became a principal promoter of communism. Odd that neither Kissinger nor Isaacson acknowledged that, I thought. And Hoover was right about all those communists in the government, and Kissinger was possibly one of them, allegedly. Kissinger also appreciated Kant, but only partic but only partially embraced the philosopher's European liberalism, republicanism, and idealism. Kant's perpetual peace advocated a league of republics that cooperated according to international law, much like that which is practiced by the United Nations. Alternatively, Kissinger was also drawn to European conservatism, which focused on national sovereignty and balanced powers. Youthful fascination with Kant's political writings could have moved Kissinger toward a Wilsonian view of Americans of America's interests and mission, explained Peter Dickinson 
uh, explained Peter Dixon in his study of Kissinger. Instead, the emerge turned to Metternich and Bismarck, the prime practitioners of power politics. A Harvard International Seminar Besides being an intellectual mentor to, mentor to the fledgling diplomat, Professor Elliot became one of Kissinger's most influential mid-career patrons. To his credit, the flashy Southern educator overcame the academic jealousy that caused most other Harvard colleagues to snub Henry. Elliot knew his bright student could readily surpass his intellectual prowess, so he dedicated himself to helping him when he needed it. When Elliot's aide Kissinger found work, with Elliot's aid, Kissinger found work, made extra money, and established an academic and political base at Harvard. As the university's summer school director, Elliot helped Kissinger start a project that served him well, the Harvard International Seminar. The program, which invited some of the world's most promising young leaders to Harvard, ran successfully from 1951 to 1968. During that time, Kissinger personally selected hundreds of young elected officials, civil servants, and journalists to participate. As America assumed greater influence in the Western Alliance, aspiring leaders from around the globe hungered for an invitation to visit Cambridge for the summer. Henry obliged dozens of them. As the program evolved, Kissinger solicited Harvard's power elite to participate. At 28, wrote Isaacson, he was developing a power base within the academic bureaucracy. There was even money to dispense. The seminar was well funded, and Kissinger could offer a fat fee to the professors he invited to lecture. Kissinger was not shy about calling famous professors, both at Harvard and around the country, pouring on doses of flattery and asking if they would be kind enough to lecture his students. Those who spoke at Kissinger's behest ranged from Eleanor Roosevelt to Southern poet John Crow Ranson, from so sociologist David Reisman to the labor leader Walter Ruther. Money for international money for the international seminar came from the university, the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, and elsewhere. Kissinger spent much of his time hustling funds. Beginning in 1953, a group named Friends of the Middle East began giving grants that eventually totaled just under two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Later, it was revealed that the group was a CIA front. Kissinger was panicky at first, fearing that it might ruin his reputation. He stormed into his office the day the story broke and flew into a rage, but the controversy soon blew over. Might his military background and service to army intelligence have boosted his concerns? I questioned in the silence of my Bellingham hotel room. Additional links to domestic intelligence. By the time Kissinger set sail for Cambridge, he had established vital connections to the military and intelligence community. In fact, his intelligence contacts included not only Fritz Kramer and General Bowling, but Helmut Sonnefeld, who later became Kissinger's counselor at the State Department, and Henry Rozvosky who attended Kissinger's class on German paramilitary organizations when the two were stationed in Obermagau. Rawalski later became a noted economist and dean at Harvard. In summary, Kissinger was at the center of the good old boy intelligence network even before the Ford and Rockefeller Foundations funded his international seminar, I realized. So, in July 1953, when a batch of 40 envelopes addressed to foreign seminar participants arrived at Kissinger's office, he curiously opened one. To his dismay, it contained literature 
critical of American military policy and ban the bomb propaganda. Enraged, he phoned Boston's FBI field office and an agent was sent to investigate. The final part of the investigator's confidential report read, Kissinger identified himself as an individual who is strongly sympathetic to the FBI. Steps will be taken to make Kissinger a confidential source of this division. As a result, Kissinger was occasionally contacted at Harvard for information valuable to domestic intelligence. In return for his kindness, Many of the international seminar participants extended their host invitations to visit them in their native lands. This, coupled with Kissinger's intelligence, interest provided numerous opportunities for overseas travel. In 1951, for instance, the Operations Research Office of the Army sent Kissinger as a graduate student to Korea to assess the impact of the U.S. military presence on civilian life. The following summer, Kissinger returned to Germany and met with leading German industrialists in Dusseldorf and was feted at a dinner in his honor held in the dining room of the Krupp munitions plant. Who would have thought he joked to his parents? Thank you ladies who know that Krupp was one of the Nazis or the major Nazi sympathizers. Kissinger's real politic Visions of a New World Order, Kissinger's real politic, his practical philosophy of political history, as described in his Harvard thesis and demonstrated by his diplomatic behavior, showed that throughout his career he sought to preserve and even define a world order. His approach to peace implied artfully tending to balances of power. World peace was, therefore, not the defining policy objective for Kissinger. Kissinger believed that a balance of power was the best that could be obtained. This, he believed, could be achieved through the acceptance and control of limited conflicts, small wars. And that's exactly what the United States has been doing ever since World War II. Small war here, small war there, another small war here, oh, another little 20 year small war over here. Thanks, Kissinger. Still at it, are we? Where were we? Kissinger believed that a balance of power was the best that could be obtained. This, he believed, could be achieved through the acceptance and control of limited conflict, small wars. With this in mind, the diplomat's mission was to assure that the United States and not the Russians would lead and win many of these. We didn't win any of them. And we haven't won a single war after World War II. Failure after failure after failure. Kissinger's conservative real politik was based on the principle taught by realists from Karl von Clausewitz to Hans Morgenthau the diplomats, that diplomacy cannot be divorced from the realities of force and power, but diplomacy should not but diplomacy should be divorced. Kissinger argued from a moralistic and meddlesome concern with the internal policies of other nations. Stability is the prime goal of diplomacy. It is served when nations accept the legitimacy of the existing world order, and when they act based on their national interests. It is threatened when nations embark on theological or moral crusades. His was a quest for a real politic, devoid, devoid of moral homilies. He said, said his Harvard colleague Stanley Hoffman, From the beginning of his thesis, the political historian established a premise that would define his career's work. Whenever peace, conceived as the avoidance of war, has been the primary objective of a power or a group of powers, Kissinger wrote. The international system has been at the mercy of the most ruthless member of the international community. A more appropriate goal, he advanced, was for stability based on an equilibrium of forces. In one instance, Stosinger asked Kissinger his preference between a revolutionary 
a bit for Strosinger asked Kissinger his preference between a revolutionary state committed to justice versus a ruling state that sought unjust ends. Kissinger replied by paraphrasing Goethe, If I had to choose between justice and order on the one hand and injustice and order on the other, I would always choose the latter. Kissinger believed that summit conferences with the other superpowers only served a propaganda objective. In his first article in the lay press, The Limitations of Diplomacy, published in the New Republic in 1955, he contended that summit meetings with the communists could only raise false hopes, yet they should be conducted to win neutral nations' confidence and assuage Allied concerns. Later, he advanced the belief that China's and Russia's revolutionary tendencies could be mitigated by offering them a legitimate stake in the international system. Thus, the game plan for the New World Order was established. The Foreign Affairs Minister In April 1955, Kissinger's first major national security policy paper appeared in Foreign Affairs, a prestigious quarterly published by the Council on Foreign Relations in New York. The report, developed at the request of Harvard history professor Arthur Schlesinger, advanced Kissinger's critique of the massive retaliation doctrine that proposed an all-out nuclear response to Soviet attack. In the report, Kissinger argued that the massive retaliation doctrine acquired during the Eisenhower years was dangerously outdated. The Soviets now had their own bomb, threatened all-out nuclear retaliation for Soviet expansion into the gray areas of the world was, therefore, no longer credible. As Soviet nuclear strength increases, he wrote, the number of areas that will seem worth the destruction of New York, Detroit, or Chicago will steadily diminish. An all-or-nothing military policy, therefore, makes for a paralysis of diplomacy. Kissinger called for policy change in which the capacity to wage localized little wars was emphasized. Foreign Affairs peace had two notable consequences. It laid the groundwork for Kissinger's theory that the U.S. should prepare to fight limited nuclear wars, a doctrine that became the intellectual precursor to the Kennedy administration's flexible response strategy and NATO's decision to deploy intermediate-range nuclear weapons in Europe. In addition, Isaacson noted, The article helped get Kissinger a job at the Council on Foreign Relations, a post that would catapult him from the obscurity of an untenured instructor to the celebrity of a best-selling nuclear strategist. The Council on Foreign Relations The Council on Foreign Relations, CFR, was founded in 1921 by members of Manhattan's internationally-minded business and legal elite. Contrary to what I had assumed, the CFR is a private organization that serves as a discussion club for close to 3,000 well-connected aficionados of foreign affairs. Beneath chandeliers and stately portraits in its Park Avenue mansions, Members attend lectures, dinners, and roundtable seminars featuring top officials and visiting world leaders, Isaacson further revealed. The most exalted enterprises at the Council are the study groups, which consist of about a dozen distinguished members and wise men who meet regularly for a year or so to explore a particular subject. Each has a study director often a rising star in the academic world. The group that Kissinger was asked to direct had been formed in November 1954 to probe the topic of nuclear weapons and foreign policy. Kissinger's group met almost monthly and was chaired by the former head of the Atomic Energy Commission, Department of Energy, 
Gordon Dean included the evening discussions was included in the evening discussions was such foreign policy mavens as Paul Nitzin, a previous director of the State Department's Policy Planning Committee, the department's director, Robert Bowie, who later became Kissinger's academic antagonist at Harvard, Lieutenant General James Gavin, whose belief in the potential of nuclear technology to cure American military deficiencies proved infectious, and David Rockefeller, who was enthralled by Gavin's recommendations for military industrialization and soon hereafter acquired two chairmanships, one of the council and the others and the other of Chase Bank. Graduated Deterrence Doctrine Among Kissinger's first invited guests was Harvard's Dean McGeorge Bundy, who arrived in December 1955 to lead a fascinating discussion on NATO strategy. It was one of the first times that abstract theorizing about limited nuclear war was related to the defense doctrine that later became known as flexible response, wrote Isaacson. When Nietzsche, Kissinger's cohort on the topic of limited nuclear war, argued that threatened massive nuclear retaliation might be considered a bluff, Bundy replied, can we not develop a concept for the graduated application of power? Is it essential that we find some flexible policy six years later as national security advisor during the Kennedy administration? Bundy helped activate this flexible response doctrine. Yeah, if nuclear bombs ain't going to do it, let's just do bioweapons, right? Kissinger, with some discomfort had by then accepted the view that for the foreseeable future, the U.S. would have to rely on nuclear weapons in fighting even a limited war. It would be extremely dangerous, Kissinger argued, to become paralyzed by the belief that any use of nuclear weapons would automatically escalate to an all-out war. Like Nietzsche, he endorsed the concept of graduated deterrence, which meant being willing to fight limited wars with tactical nuclear weapons. One of the crucial problems facing the U.S., Kissinger said at the time, was to develop a doctrine for the graduated employment of force. On reading this, I wondered, could the incredible proliferation of chemical and biological weapons during the late 1960s and early 1970s have been the result of Kissinger's articulated need for nuclear alternatives, a broader weapon arsenal that might allow for more graduated deterrence and flexible response capabilities? I reflected on the fact that the order for AIDS-like viruses came during Nixon's years in office when Henry Kissinger ran the National Security Council, NSC. Early Rockefeller Influence Among Kissinger's most influential patrons, as he worked his way up the ladder of success to become Nixon's deputy to the president for national security was Nelson Aldrich Rockefeller, the son of Standard Oil heir John D. Rockefeller Jr. The Rockefeller family's involvement in the medical industrial complex, health science research, and American politics deserves some background. Before World War II, major administration of medical research or financing by federal agencies had been generally opposed by America's scientific community. Whoa, wait. I gotta read that again. Before World War II, major administration of medical research or fi financing by federal agencies had been generally opposed by American scientific community. In fact, it was only during times of war that organizations like the National Academy of Sciences and the National Research Council received major funding. Both the NAS established both the NAS established during the Civil War and the NRC set up during the First World War were largely ignored in times of peace. But if we're always at war, they'll always get funding. If there's always fear, there'll always be funding. 
Between 1900 and 1940, private foundations and universities financed most medical research. According to Paul Starr, author of The Social Transformation of American Medicine, The Rise of a Sovereign Profession, and The Making of a Vast Industry, the most richly endowed research center. The Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research was established in New York in 1902. By 1928, had received from John D. Rockefeller $65 million in endowment funds. In contrast, as late as 1938, as little as $2.8 million in federal funding was budgeted for the entire public health services. Therefore, it is easy to see that Rockefeller family investment in health science research predated as far surpassed even the federal governments. More than the New Deal, the Second World War created the greatest boom in federal government and private industry support for medical research. In 1938, the National Institute of Health took up residence in a privately donated estate in Bethesda, Maryland, which, it's, which is still its home today. Prior to the war, American science and medicine was heavily influenced by German models. This precedent, however, changed during the 1930s when the Nazis purged Jewish scientists from German universities and biological laboratories. These changes, according to Starr, significantly altered the course of American health science and medicine. Many of Germany's most brilliant Jewish researchers emigrated to the United States just as the movement Burgoyne to privatize war-related biological and medical research. At this time, the Rockefeller-led medical industrial complex was fully poised to influence and take advantage of Congress's first series of measures to promote cancer research and cancer control. In 1937, the new federal legislation authorized an establishment authorized the establishment of the National Cancer Institute under the NIH, and for the first time, the Public Health Service to make grants to outside researchers, according to Starr. The war gave medical research priority. In July 1941, President Roosevelt created an Office of Scientific Research and Development, OSRD, with two parallel committees on National Defense and Medical Research. The Committee on Medical Research, CMSR, undertook a comprehensive research program to deal with the medical problems of the war. The work, costing $15 million, involved 450 contracts with universities and another 150 with research institutes, hospitals, and other organizations. Altogether, some 5,500 5, scientists and technicians were employed in the enterprise. Moreover, according to E. Richard Brown's Rockefeller Medicine Men, the Rockefellers exercised significant control over the outcomes of these efforts through the foundations they established. Rockefeller befriends Kissinger. Following the war, Nelson Rockefeller remained active in the CFR, and in 1955, while serving as President Eisenhower's assistant for international affairs, invited Kissinger to discuss national security issues at the Quantico, Virginia Marine Base. Following their meeting, according to Isaacson, the diplomat became Rockefeller's closest intellectual associate, and soon after, Kissinger authored several military proposals for Eisenhower to consider. Unimpressed, Eisenhower turned them down. As a result, Rockefeller sent Eisenhower his resignation and then launched a special studies project that explored the critical choices America faced militarily in the coming years. Kissinger agreed to direct this new project and published a 468-page book on his findings. The treaty proposed that tactical nuclear weapons be developed and a bomb shelter be built in every house. In preparation for limited thermonuclear war, 
The willingness to engage in nuclear war was necessary is part of the price of our freedom, Kissinger argued. If somebody's that willing to do so epic amounts of nuclear war, you think biological weapons would be the, the moral way out. No, biological weapons, they linger around much more and the infrastructure is still intact so you don't have to rebuild. Isn't that neat? I suddenly realized that the anxiety I felt in grade school while drilling for possible nuclear t attacks was part of Kissinger's price for freedom. Eisenhower had warned America that the gravest threat to world security, democracy, and even spirituality was the growing military-industrial complex. I recalled, and the Rockefellers and Kissinger and the Rockefellers and Kissinger played leading roles in its expansion. For more than 10 years, Nelson Rockefeller's nuclear policy guru remained a well-paid Chase Bank consultant and Harvard faculty member. During that time, Kissinger continued writing numerous books and articles on subjects related to the practical application of his real politique in the nuclear age. He also continued to provide favors and advice to White House dignitaries and Rockefeller executives until late 1968. After Rockefeller lost the Republican presidential nomination to Nixon, Kissinger then joined Nixon's staff. The the National Security Council job. Following the 1968 Republican convention, Richard Allen Nixon's foreign policy advisor contacted Kissinger to serve on his advisory board. The invitation was not only in difference to Kissinger's formidable intelligence on the subject, but as remuneration for helping Nixon abreast the latest developments in Paris in the Paris peace negotiations, which ended the bombing in Vietnam. Right. During the last days of the campaign, Nixon noted, when Kissinger was providing us with information about the bombing halt, I became more aware of his knowledge and his influence. Kissinger had served as Nixon's spook in the Johnson camp. He kept the Republican presidential candidate abreast for campaign speeches and meetings with the press. In appreciation, Nixon rewarded him with the top position in national security. Nixon's aim in appointing Kissinger to be in charge of the National Security Council was to run foreign policy from the White House. Undoubtedly, the chief executive intended to emasculate the State Department. As vice president under Eisenhower, Nixon felt abused by members of the State Department who, treating him with contempt, in retaliation, he intended to usurp the power of the State Department bureaucracy by establishing a strong National Security Council staff in the White House that would take over from state responsibility. Oh, my goodness. That's a long sentence I gotta redo. As Vice President under Eisenhower, Nixon felt abused by members of the State Department who treated him with contempt. In retaliation, he intended to usurp the power of the State Department bureaucracy by establishing a strong National Security Council staff in the White House that would take over from state the responsibility for developing policy options. That kind of sounds like treason. Kissinger agreed with Nixon's mission, and the two men struck a bond. Fucking Nixon. Besides Kissinger, three other candidates for the National Security Post were interviewed by the president. They included Robert Strauss, Hoop, and William Kinter of the University of Pennsylvania, and Roy Ash, president of Littleton Industries. Holy smokes, I burst. Will you look at that? Littleton Industries President Roy Ash was Kissinger's alternate for national for the national security job. I immediately realized Littleton Industries was the parent company to Littleton Bionetics, the firm Gallo and his co-workers often cited as their funding source. Now when was that? I searched Kissinger for the date. 
January 1969, just six months before Congress was asked to fund the DoD contract for AIDS-like viruses. The following week back from the West Coast and on tour in New York, I stopped in the public library to look up Roy Ashen, Who's Who, the business executive and co-founder of Littleton Industries Incorporated in Beverly Hills, California, had directed the military mega contractor from 1953 to 1972. In 1969, instead of the NSC directorship, Nixon appointed him chairman of the President's Advisory Council on Executive Organizations, on which, ser on which he served until 1971. Then he was elevated to the rank of assistant to the President of the United States. He served the Nixon and Ford administrations in this capacity, as well as directed the Office of Management and Budget for the White House until 1975. The silent coup begins. In order to direct foreign policy from the White House, Nixon needed to sap the traditional powers of the state and defense departments and centralize control in the West Wing, specifically in the hands of Nixon and Kissinger, Isaacson wrote. The principal purpose of this strategy was not only to appease Nixon's megalomaniacal megalomaniacal the purpose the principal purpose of the strategy was not only to appease nixon's megalomaniacal insecurity but to punish the agency that had irresponsibly guided america through its worst international embarrassment vietnam to establish new policy in the old state department painstaking negotiations among countless bureaucrats were required for even the simplest decisions. Inst institutional input from dozens of agencies, including the CIA, FBI, Pentagon, and State Department, resulted in glacial changes, fuzzy conclusions swathed in murky language, and a resistance to reopening issues once a bureaucratic consensus had been reached. Nixon wanted to revisit a horde of issues and, like Kissinger, tended to circumvent instead to confront immovable bureaucracies. The National Security Council became their vehicle for securing this liberty. I guess that makes sense. The National Security Council had been created in 1947 during the Truman administration in response to Franklin Roosevelt's habit of leaving certain agencies in the dark when he made decisions. Its membership, known as the NSC's Principles, included the President, Vice President, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, and other top officials such as the Director of Central Intelligence designated by the President. Hold on a second. <laughs> During the Kennedy and Johnson years, the significance of the NSC w waned. But the importance of a separate but related entity, the National Security Council staff, grew to assume the most powerful role in American government, headed by a special assistant who eventually became known as the National Security Advisor. The staff became a personal mini-bureaucracy that could analyze policy, devise tactics, and carry out operations for the president often without the other principles of the National Security Council being informed. That was precisely what Kissinger and Nixon wanted. Following their reorganization of the agency, Kissinger gained veto power over the State Department or other agency proposals, virtually virtual control over the National Security Council meeting agendas, the ability to hold secret meetings with the state defense and other department directors so that he alone could privately negotiate with them without revealing his purpose to others. And could this same system that Mr. Kissinger came up with be used in reverse? When the president says do this or do that, he says yes sir, yes sir, and everything does exactly the opposite. Food for thought. From the start, Under Secretary of State, you Alex... Alex, 
Alexis Johnson recalled, It was obvious that Kissinger was extremely insecure and had, obs and had an obsession, which persisted throughout his White House years, that the State Department and Foreign Service were determined to undermine him. The result, concluded Isaacson, was a national security apparatus well-crafted for a diplomacy-based, bold, the result, concluded Isaacson, was a national security apparatus well-crafted for a diplomacy based on bold new approaches, secrecy, surprise, and tactical maneuvering. On the other hand, it was not as well suited for building a bureaucratic and public consensus for major policies, nor for creating institutional checks on a defiant president who was prone to acting on impulse. All of Kissinger's men. When Kissinger began to look for a Na National Security Council military assistant, Colonel Alexander Haig was recommended by Robert McNamara, Defense Secretary under Kennedy, and Joseph Califano, Secretary of Health and Human Services under Jimmy Carter. Califano, according to Isaacson, had known Haig from his days as a staff officer in the Pentagon. In fact, Califano had been Haig's boss at the Pentagon in the early 1960s. On further research in New York Public Library, I learned that both had received law degrees. Califano received his from Harvard in 1955, the year Kissinger submitted his Meaning of History for his Ph.D. What's more, all these had served in the Army during the war. From 1964 to 1965, Haig served as Deputy Special Assistant to the Secretary of the Army and as Deputy Secretary of Defense of the Army while Califano was at the Pentagon as Special Assistant to the Secretary and Deputy Secretary of the DOD. Kissinger's old mentor, Fritz Kramer, also urged him to tap Haig, whom he later called my other great discovery. Unlike the myriad other NSC staff Kissinger had sent to the executive office building, Haig and personnel assistant Eagleburger set up shop in the basement of the White House just outside Kissinger's West Wing office. Soon Haig began administering the most sensitive projects in his quest to become the NSC director's deputy. Haig's duties were manifold, explained Isaacson. He served as the emissary to FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover and others who might suspect Kissinger as being soft. He taught Kissinger about the perks of power, and soon came to handle overseeing a secret FBI program wiretap, the home telephones, and other members of the National Security Council staff. Morton Halpern and Helmut Sonnefeld, two Kissinger NSC appointees, both of whom had designs on the vacant deputy director personnel. Why did I add personnel? Both of whom had designs on the vacant deputy director position would be the first two victims of that program. Kissinger became convinced that Haig would never threaten his relationship with Nixon or become disloyal. Matching Nixon's White House austerity, an air of secrecy surrounded the NSC in those days. The President and Kissinger both were paranoid that underlings were out to get them, so they labored to make themselves invincible. They served channels of communication and routinely destroyed paper trails to limit their accessibility and vulnerability. Their staff, in essence, operated with information provided only, as in the CIA, on a need-to-know basis. Compared to President Johnson, who maintained a bank of phones and sought information from a variety of sources within and beyond his administration, Nixon was a loner who trusted few others. If I needed to get a hold of somebody, Johnson bragged to an aide on leaving his replacement's Oval Office, all I had to do was mash a button, and I mean anybody, even some little fellow tucked away in one of the agencies. Nixon, he reported with wonder, had just one dinky phone, with three buttons, that's all. 
just three buttons, and they all go to Germans. Likewise, Kissinger's paranoia drove him to make unparalleled demands on the staff. He ended the practice of allowing chief administrators to share their expertise with Nixon in his absence. Isaacson reported he would not even allow high-level staff to accompany him to meetings with the president except in rare cases. Winston Lord, a former Kissinger aide, believed this behavior reflected his treacherous mixture of ego and insecurity. Ultimately, White House morale suffered as the anticipation and thrill of presidential encounters eroded. For instance, when Morton Halperin provided CIA Director Richard Helms a routine summary of the NSC's first meeting agenda, Kissinger protested. He did not object to what was said, only that an underling had presumed to address a cabinet official. Kissinger ordered Haig to rule no staffers is to talk to principals. The White House wiretaps. Kissinger's angst that members of his staff would undermine his leadership and violate the secrecy he needed to carry out his real politic transformed into full-blown paranoia when the New York Times broke the story about American B-52 bombers hitting North Vietnam. Kissinger then ordered Haig to Hoover's office to direct the FBI to wiretap six of Kissinger's aides eight other officials, and four prominent journalists. In all, there would be 17 FBI wiretaps ordered by the White House under the justification of national security, 13 of them on government employees, four on newsmen. The program would last for 21 months until February 1971. As the summaries came to Kissinger's office, Haig would read them show his boss the interesting parts, and then store them in a safe. Other aides began to suspect something. Soon after the wiretaps had begun, Roger Morris went to the hospital to visit Lawrence Eagleburger, Kissinger's personal assistant who had collapsed from nervous exhaustion. Tears came to Eagleburger's eyes as he told his old friend from the Foreign Service about the tapping. Don't say anything you don't want ha Haldeman or Henry to read over breakfast, Eagleburger warned. Anthony Lake, another idealistic staffer, stumbled across a wiretap summary involving one of their colleagues, and he told Morris about it. Roger and I decided not to confront Kissinger, he recalled. We were fighting on enough fronts, but every now and then when we were talking on the phone, we'd wish J. Edgar Hoover a Merry Christmas. To protect his flanks, Hoover had Attorney General John Mitchell sign the wiretap authorizations. Likewise, Kissinger targeted Hoover and Haig for his alibi. He used a written defense to inc incriminate Hoover. He wrote in his memoirs, J. Edgar Hoover invariably listed some official outside the FBI hierarchy as requesting each wiretap, even in cases where I had heard Hoover himself specifically recommend them to Nixon. Though he had instructed Haig to deliver the wiretap order to Hoover, Kissinger later told friends that Haig originated the plan. Isaacson wrote that much of what was requested in Kissinger's name, he insisted was done on Haig's own initiative. And there was some truth to the charge. Haig used the program to further his own interests and spy on his rivals. He also rationalized the surveillance as something previous administrations had done. I don't think there was any more or less wiretapping during the Nixon administration than in previous years. The FBI's intelligence division, Chief J James Adams, said, however... What was unusual about this was that it involved wiretaps on the NSC staff, on individuals that were part of the White House family. Administration officials had previously ordered wiretaps to spy on potential criminal union leaders and organized mobsters. A wiretapping program set against one's own staff was, according to another top FBI official, Thomas Smith, unprecedented. Deputy 
FBI Director William Sullivan was charged with overseeing Kissinger's wiretap operation. Hoover later discharged Sullivan for insubordination since he was suspected of plotting against the FBI Director for the benefit of the CIA and Nixon White House officials, particularly Haig and Kissinger. The surveillance program reflected quite a natural temptation, especially for two people with a touch of paranoia, Isaacson concluded. Two eavesdrop on what others are saying, colleagues, subordinates, rivals, and enemies, gives a heavy sense of power that has tempted people even more ethically fastidious than Kissinger and Nixon. The program, which ultimately led to the plumbers, which led to Watergate, illustrated what can happen when a White House is intent on pursuing policies, such as the bombing of Cambodia, that it feels it cannot dare let the public discover. It is the part of my public service about which I am most ambivalent, Kissinger said, referring to the phase of his career. Referring to this phase of his career, this was as close as he ever came to saying he was sorry. Yeah, because everything he suggested was a failure. In the eyes of the average American public, but he was could have been a winner if he planned it all to begin with. The Great Power Grab for Nixon, National Security... National Security Council meetings quickly became bothersome. Rather than having to deal with issues and objections raised by State Department Director William Rogers and Defense Secretary Melvin Laird, both of whom threatened Kissinger's power and ego, Nixon directed Haldeman to announce a decision he and Kissinger had been considering for five months. The new role of the National Security Council advisor would be to oversee the Departments of Defense and State. Thereafter, rather than exploring foreign policy matters during full NSC meetings, Nixon and Kissinger decided them alone. Cut NSC to one, cut National Security Council to one every two weeks, or once a month, read Haldeman's notes of the great power grab. Moore brought privately to President for his discussion with Kissinger, later in the meeting, Nixon informed Haldeman that from now on, Kissinger should direct National Security Council agenda discussions directly to him before informing agency chiefs during council meetings. In this way, the two came to decisions without Rogers and Laird being informed. No appeal, Nixon ordered, as he frequently did for emphasis. This suited Kissinger just fine, wrote Isaacson, who chronicled. From the start, he had been seeking to make foreign policy and privacy with Nixon whenever possible. For the very first National Security meeting, for the very first National Security Council meeting, which dealt with Vietnam options, he had Halperin do a two-page cover memo summarizing the plans to put forth state and other agencies. There were little boxes for Nixon to initial. Kissinger looked at it and told Halpern, fine, but now tell him what to do. Halpern was a little taken aback. Having heard all of Kissinger's pronouncements about how the NSC staff would merely pass along options, the summary documents with Kissinger's recommended course of action were to become another of the secrets that Kissinger had to keep from the State Department and the rest of the government. The power shift was quickly announced by the press. After only three weeks at the White House, Time's cover story featured Kissinger. Already, the article said Kissinger is widely suspected in Washington of being a would-be usurper of the powers traditionally delegated to the state and defense departments, and humility is not a hallmark. Likewise, the New York Times reported that Kissinger is taking over the responsibility for coordinating foreign policy in the Nixon administration, a mandate formally assigned to the Secretary of State. At this point, I questioned, what were Kissinger's responsibilities? Might they have included directing Defense Department research activities? 
Did he order the request for appropriations for the development of AIDS-like viruses? Could he have discussed with Roy Ashe the award granted to Gallo through Littleton Bionetics for developing for the development of immune destru- system destroying viruses following Nixon's signing of the Geneva Accord? Had Roy Ashe informed Kissinger about such policies from his company from his company's research and development reports? Isaacson quickly answered the first of my questions with a resounding yes. The chairman of the National Security Council Senior Review Group. He was in the most powerful position to determine what issues reached the presidency as well as the agency directors, as shown in figure 11.2, quickly set up a covey of other committees, all of which he chaired to give him better control over specific topics. They included the Defense Program Review Committee, which considered the funding requests for weapons and other military needs. Oh, let me just take over the purse strings of the country. No big deal. The 40 Committee, a new name for an older panel which was in charge of authorizing covert actions by the CIA and other agencies. They just gave this man all the power. My God. Jesus Christ. The Vietnam Special Studies Group set up in September 1969, which coordinated military and diplomatic policy regarding the war. This is all more... This should be cool. These are all bulletin points, but this is what... Kissinger quickly set up a a covey of other committees. This is the covey of other committees Kissinger set up to usurp the power of our nation, basically. The verification panel formed in July 1969, which ostensibly analyzed whether compliance with different arms control proposals could be verified by U.S. intelligence, but which was soon in charge of maintaining all arms negotiations. Coming from the guy that wants to nuclear bomb everybody on a small scale. Oh, yeah. The Washington Special Action Group, set up after North Korea's downing of the EC-121 plane, which handled breaking events and crises. From 1968 to 1971, the Kissinger-directed National Security Council annual budget jumped from $700,000 to $2.2 million, as its staff almost doubled to 105 administrative aides. In essence, during the Nixon years... In essence, during Nixon's years in office, Kissinger dictated foreign as well as domestic policy procedures and programs to everyone, including those in command of the military and intelligence communities. In one case, CIA Director Richard Helms bore the brunt of Kissinger's power. Kissinger had never felt comfortable with aristocrats like Helms, so he ordered the CIA patrician to supply raw intelligence data rather than summary reports for the National Security Council director to personally interpret. That's actually a smart move. It skewed our way of writing estimates, especially about the Soviets, Helms complained. He would. It estimate the estimates had to provide a vast amount of data so Kissinger could make up his own mind. In another instance, Kissinger pressured military directors, including Laird, to fall in line. In early 1969, he phoned Admiral Zumwalt, Chief of Naval Operations, over an issue regarding Africa. Laird was outraged. He insisted that all National Security Council military dealings should run through him. Kissinger argued that as the president's representative, he held the power to command military operations. Jesus. I have the power! A few weeks later, when Zumwalt and Kissinger met at a social event, the Navy chief noted that he shared Laird's objections to dealing outside of the chain of command. But Kissinger was adamant. It was a matter of both power and principle. He felt and he 
and he insisted that he had the right to deal with all members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff directly. From then on, says Zumwalt, every time we got together for business, he referred to it as a non-meeting. Without Kissinger's knowledge, Zumwalt kept Laird fully informed. Kissinger's desire to control foreign policy, Isaacson wrote, was not wholly unwarranted. By keeping close tabs on the bureaucracy, he was able to dispel some of the stale thinking that, perme that permeated. I've heard of per that's permeated, yeah. By keeping close tabs on the bureaucracy, he was able to dispel some of the stale thinking that permeated the state and defense departments. My distrust of Kissinger for having played a key role in the development and possible deployment of AIDS-like viruses was not unwarranted according to Eisenstein's record. In the summer of 1969, he ordered a study on chemical and biological weapons. He was dubious about whether they had much use in war-fighting strategy. He assumed correctly that little thought had been given to the issue. By asking for a range of feasible options, Kissinger guaranteed that he possi gu Kissinger guaranteed that the possibility of eliminating the program would be listed, if only as an extreme option to set off the policy the military preferred. What returned to Kissinger's desk was a mask of opaque pro prose that even he couldn't understand. I can't even read this paper, he bellowed. But he knew that an opportunity had been uncovered. Isaacson concluded he had his staff sharpen the wording so that the options became clearer in making his decision to pronounce first use of chemical weapons and to dismantle production of biological ones. Nixon stressed the novelty of the review process and how well it had worked. He also effectively misled the media and world powers that the United States had turned away from the evils of biological warfare. Yeah. Nothing could have been further from the truth. That night, from my New York hotel room, with Kissinger on my lap and military intelligence on my mind, I telephoned Jackie. Get this, I said. Kissinger undoubtedly ordered the defense... De Kissinger undoubtedly ordered the Department of Defense Appropriations request for the AIDS-like viruses. How do you know that, she asked. It's apparent from what I just read. I'll tell you about it when I get home. Here's a picture. Diagram 11.2. And I think that's it for today. Is it? Yep. Took long enough, right?